Dale Gentry is our next speaker, and he's the Director of Conservation for Audubon Upper Mississippi River. Um, prior to starting with Audubon in 2021, Dale spent 15 years in higher education as a professor at the Teton Science Schools in Grand Teton National Park and the University of Northwestern St. Paul, teaching ecology, ornithology, and conservation biology, and studying woodpeckers um, and community ecology of forested ecosystems. Uh, in graduate school, Dale studied the community ecology of cup-nesting songbirds in natural river corridors and man-made woodlots for his masters and the keystone species concept in cavity-nesting communities in post-fire conifer forests in the Black Hills in South Dakota for his PhD. Dale. Thank you. Uh, that little intro remind me how much I enjoy hearing stories about cavity nesting birds and bring me back to the good old days of studying woodpeckers. But we're not going to talk about any woodpeckers today. Actually, there will be an exception to that. We'll, we'll slide a red-headed woodpecker in at some point. Uh, I am excited to talk with you today about a program that is uh, active in the Western United States, but is new to uh, our corner of the Midwest, it's called Audubon Conservation Ranching, and it's a, a novel approach to the conservation of grassland birds. Uh, as we all probably mentally prepared ourselves for this morning, some bad news, right? And uh, this bad news is, is long standing. Most recently, maybe not most recently, but most poignantly in 2019, the, the uh, report came out that we all now call the Three Billion Birds Report that shows that our hunches and our impressions, we now have data to back up that there are just fewer birds in North America than there were when we were younger. The study compared roughly 1970 to 2020 and the trends along the way from Breeding Bird Survey and the Christmas Bird Count and the, all of the data sources from the weather radar and everything else that we could compile. And we found that, again, there are about 3 billion fewer birds in North America than there once were. And we start to tease that apart into groups of birds. We find that uh, almost all birds are declining, although there are a few exceptions. Waterfowl and raptors generally are doing a little better. And of all those bird groups that are declining, grassland birds are in the greatest trouble. They have declined more than 50%. And so we'll see data that are continually discouraging. Again, we, we heard earlier about the 98% decline in Western Meadowlark. And here are the data to back that up. These are all breeding bird survey data from Minnesota uh, following trends from, from the late 60s until uh, roughly 2020. Uh, and they are not the only grassland bird in Minnesota that are declining. Basically, all of them are, right? And it's just a, a matter of how steep that trend is and how low it goes. Uh, but all grassland birds are declining, and we kind of know why that is, right? It's because grassland bird habitat, also great place to grow corn and soybeans. And that the drive of, uh, of agricultural expansion and intensification has not been good for native prairie ecosystems, which is the habitat that these grassland birds need. And so uh, we are experiencing uh, a, a crisis, right, of how to conserve grassland birds. And this is true not only for our tall grass prairies of the upper Midwest, but grassland and arid land ecosystems, which dominate much of the central and western United States, come in many different forms and functions. I grew up in the basin steppe ecosystems of southern Idaho, and there we're dealing with declines of sage sparrows and uh, long-billed curlews and, uh, and greater prairie chickens, just like we had stories of, of uh, bobolinks and upland sandpipers in the Midwest, right? So uh, across grassland ecosystems, we're seeing declines. Uh, across grassland ecosystems, we see unique communities of grassland birds, and again, most of the news is quite discouraging. And I'm going to try and not be such a downer for this entire talk, but we have to set the stage for why we need uh, new initiatives, new approaches, right, to doing something about grassland bird communities in Minnesota, in North America, in the Western Hemisphere. I suspect the patterns would be uh, consistent in the Eastern Hemisphere as well, although I actually don't know almost nothing about uh, their patterns. So, um, so ultimately, we have a, a crisis for grassland birds, 
and a, a motivation for doing something about it and considering new options, right? And so when we think about bird conservation, we often, uh, really any conservation, we, we, we use the science of conservation biology, and we also study patterns, right? What has worked and what hasn't worked. And in recent past, the most positive stories about bird conservation come from things like raptors and waterfowl, which I alluded to, who's not un uh, uniformly, there are some waterfowl populations that are not thriving, some raptor populations that are not as well, but generally speaking, have done better than many other groups of birds. And when we look at the patterns, what we can learn from some of those uh, uh, recoveries and improvements, we see some things that can be replicated in grassland ecosystems and, and many things that, that are not, right? Ultimately, the biggest challenge here is, is habitat. And thanks to partners like Pheasants Forever, Ducks Unlimited, Nature Conservancy, we're working on habitat for you know, waterfowl and grassland birds, but there just isn't enough protected land. So excited to see those numbers from Pheasants Forever, right? Really impressive, the amount of land that we protected but it's not enough yet. Hopefully we will continue those trends. Those, those, uh, those, that, that graph trend will continue to the, uh, to the north and east, right? But ultimately we need more protected lands if we're gonna depend on protected lands to conserve grassland birds. Policy approaches like the Conservation Reserve Program are effective, temporary, sometimes very localized. They've been around for decades and they haven't uh, halted the, the uh, alarming trends of, of grassland bird declines. Uh, incentive programs and policies from agencies, again, they're all good ideas. None of them have been effective enough to prevent the decline of grassland birds. And when we look at these declines, the message is ultimately they are tied to economic forces. As I mentioned, to agriculture, which is a good thing, right? We need agriculture and food we love our farmers. Many of them are conservationists, and they want to produce food for us and have biodiversity at the same time, right? And so they are looking for strategies to accomplish those goals, uh, which we need to help them uh, do. So in addition to the loss of habitat, we also need to think about the degradation of habitat, right? Some of the habitat that we have is of lower quality. And part of that, thanks Greg for setting this slide up, is that our grassland ecosystems, our tall grass prairies, which may or may not be a, an ecosystem unto themselves, were once managed by uh, uh, the Native American cultures, the, the tribal cultures that preexisted our European American uh, arrival on the continent. Right? And we, we really can't say what, what uh, tall grass prairies look like without human presence because we'd have to go uh, hundreds of thousands of years back to even know what that looked like. So the prairies have always been managed. There's always been fire. There's always been grazing. And Native Americans have always done a pretty good job of managing those natural disturbances, right? So one of the things we know is that prairies need disturbance. And if we want to restore a prairie, but then give, let it go natural and not graze it or burn it, it will not continue as a prairie unless we go out with our chainsaws, but ultimately, and I'll show some data here, that prairies need disturbance, okay? So uh, there are numerous studies on this, but some of the best and most long-term studies come, these two studies both come out of Kansas, and there's actually not a huge abundance of research in Minnesota, but we're working on that to study uh, the relationship between native plant diversity and native bird diversity with disturbances like burning and grazing. But we do find that contrary to some of our natural instincts to just let it go and be natural, is that part of natural is disturbance, right? We need grazing as part of healthy grassland ecosystems. Uh, and so, both burning and grazing can, can contribute in positive ways. Some of these data uh, uh, can give the impression that, that burning is maybe uh, not very desirable, but I think it depends on when those data were collected. As we saw in our first excellent talk this morning, right, the response to burns doesn't happen immediately. It's a, a couple years delayed, but we, we do, again, overall, the, the, the data point to the positive response from native uh, plants 
and native birds to healthy disturbance regimes, right? Which means uh, grazing, not too much grazing, and not too little grazing, and burning. Don't burn every year, but don't burn every 20 years either, right? So we need natural, healthy disturbance regimes. So when we think about, uh, we're going to talk no less now about fire than we are about this part of the disturbance regime, right? Which was the historical grazers which is not just bison. We also know that elk are grazers, not browsers like deer are, right? And elk were abundant across uh, Minnesota and, and much of the upper Northwest, or uh, uh, sorry, upper, upper Midwest. Uh, so there's a, a big community of grazers, uh, right? Bison, elk, uh, prairie dogs, a long list that managed grasslands and birds evolved with those grazers that managed grasslands. But many of those native grazers, the elk, the bison, the prairie dogs, among others, are now largely missing from our prairies. Even our native prairies, right, don't often have those communities of grazers present on them. But what we do have is a non-native grazer. And speaking of invasive and what that means, and Greg's introduction to philosophy that we got earlier, thank you, Greg, for setting us up. Right, we have, um, uh, uh, it's a nuanced approach, right, to are all non-natives invasives? And do they all, are they all problematic? And we could argue about, uh, about this non-native and whether it is uh, beneficial, and I would argue that it depends, right? Depends on how they are managed, ultimately. And that cattle can be managed and grazed in a way that very much mimics bison and benefits grassland ecosystems and therefore benefits birds, they can also be managed in a way that is detrimental to conservation and contrary to any conservation benefit of any way, right? And so you and I are tasked with the challenge of discerning the cattle that are raised in a way that's beneficial to conservation and the cattle that are raised in a way that's contrary to conservation every time we go to a restaurant or a grocery store. How do you know if that hamburger is benefiting grassland birds or if it is what came from a, you know, a, a, a cow that has never seen a pasture, a, a healthy pasture at that, right? I would argue that you can't tell. I certainly can't. And if, if you could tell, I would like to know because it would make a lot of our lives easier, okay? so. Our challenge is that we don't have uh, good strategies for identifying uh, food products that come from, from uh, healthy uh, farms and, and ranches. Now, the organic grazing certification is a, is a very positive trend in this direction, right? But we know that organic means a few explicit things, right, about no GMOs, uh, no artificial herbicides and pesticides, uh, you know, uh, some standards for soil, but it really says nothing about biodiversity. We hope and we believe, and there are some data to support that there are biodiversity benefits to organic farming and ranching, but they're not very explicit. You can have organic beef that is overgrazed. You can't have organic beef that is uh, fed in a confined situation where they're fed organic feed, right? So it's helpful, but it, 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 it doesn't give us as much information as we would like to have. This is an old problem. Uh, we're not the first to be aware of this challenge in, uh, in balancing consumer need for food and, uh, and how we manage land. Aldo Leopold, uh, um, close to 100 years ago in Audubon Magazine said, well, you know, how, how do we tell the difference if a dairy buys milk from c cattle that were grazed in healthy pastures and cattle that were grazed in, in less well-managed pastures, you couldn't uh, discern the difference, okay? And so we're, we're stuck with a challenge both for farmers, right? How do they decide, like, what, what are the incentives for managing their land well? You know, there are ethical incentives and there are personal motivations, but there's not much of an economic incentive. And then what are uh, consumers to do? How do, we, how do we make decisions about what we eat? I am well aware that many of us have just said, I'm just not going to eat animal products in my diet, and that's going to simplify it. Of course, not all plants are raised in environmentally conscious ways either, but I understand the, that sort of like, I can't tell the difference, so I'm just not going to eat it. Um, 
But ultimately, we need a strategy to discern the difference between food that is raised in an environmentally conscious, and since I work for Audubon, a bird conscious way, right, and those that are not. <clears throat> and so Audubon has developed just that, a market-driven approach to use a bird-friendly ranch certification to empower you to buy beef and bison from ranchers that are creating good bird habitat, right? And it looks like this. It's a seal that says Audubon certified, grazed on Audubon certified bird-friendly land. It's on my vest. It's on our little display thing back there. It's not in supermarkets in Minnesota yet, but it will be, right? And that's what I'm excited to come here and talk to you about today. This is a program that exists in the Western United States. We have certified over 3 million acres with over 100 uh, different producers and ranchers in California and the Rockies and Texas, North and South Dakota. And, uh, and this program is expanding now into Minnesota and Wisconsin and soon Iowa. Uh, and, um, and we believe that it has a chance to, uh, to, to be a, a, a fruitful new approach to grassland bird conservation. So what are the pillars of the program? What is it based on? Number one, of course, if it's a bird conservation program, it has to be based on creating bird habitat. So there's a habitat management component. And so every ranch that says, I think I'm interested in getting certified, will get visited by our grassland ecologist, uh, and we develop a habitat management plan for their ranch. In some cases, they're already uh, doing a great job of rotationally grazing their cattle in a way that's creating pretty healthy grasslands. And we will suggest opportunities to improve that system that often includes things like let's use more native plants and fewer non-natives, that let's manage the brush and the trees, which your cattle might not mind at all, but the birds certainly pay attention to. Um, and uh, and we can create, improve the habitat conditions for the grassland birds that will, will be found in, in, their, in their environment. Uh, there's a, uh, a pillar for, for animal health and welfare. We're concerned about more than just birds. We want to make sure that those cattle are raised in an ethical way, that they're getting enough food and water and that they are you know, not overfed or underfed, uh, that they are healthy, that they are well cared for, and that they are not uh, given unnecessary uh, treatments um, with, with antibiotics and whatnot, but they are well cared for. And the third pillar uh, is uh, less, less bird-centric environmental concern, right? So making sure that we have, we're accounting for water quality and soil health and, uh, and carbon and, and uh, other components of, of uh, environmental sustainability and in the management of these, of these ranching lands, right? So ultimately, from the perspective, this, this is a, a bird-centric audience, right? So I've got a bird-centric message. I've given this presentation to lots of different groups. But many people often ask, well, how, does, how do you create bird habitat with, with grazing animals? And the concept is relatively simple. And it's just an awareness that different grassland birds have different preferences for habitat. And some of them, like uh, uh, relatively uh, low grazing, low fire circumstances, like the Hinslow sparrow, most notably in Minnesota, and other birds like really kind of heavily managed environments and actually don't even often sometimes mind those, those slightly overgrazed envi environments like horned larks. And you can imagine that you know, horned larks are, are not a very threatened species, and of course Hinslow sparrows are, because their habitat needs are much more difficult to manage for. But by uh, rot rotating cattle and keeping them in constant movement. Sometimes they're moved every single day. Sometimes they're moved a couple times a week. Sometimes they're moved once a week. But what we don't do is keep the same cattle on the same fenced pasture for the entire year because cattle will select the area with the yummiest grass or with the best shade and overgraze a portion of it and undergraze a portion or sometimes overgraze all of it if the, the ratio is off. So we use a rotational grazing pattern, which is the biggest difference between cattle and bison, which is that cattle are a little more sedentary, and bison are more prone to roaming and moving. And so we kind of force cattle to roam and move, 
by using a fencing strategy, okay? So rotational grazing creates heterogeneous uh, habitat, which is compatible with creating pretty good uh, uh, habitat for birds. Now, we want to make sure that this is not just uh, an idea that we think is beneficial for birds. So, and Audubon is a science-based organization, so in, in addition to doing conservation, we are also studying this process to make sure that the birds are responding positively to our uh, managed rotational grazing uh, strategies. So we monitor birds and plants and soil uh, across the, the region. The soil and, uh, and plant monitoring uh, varies a little bit from region to region. The bird monitoring, you probably won't be surprised since we're a bird conservation organization, is, is, uh, is very rigorous and, and specific and detailed. Um, and so we do that monitoring every two or three years on every ranch because we're just getting started in Minnesota. We've only done one round of monitoring on a couple of ranches and I got to go out and count birds this summer. And it was just a delight to see bobolinks and henslow sparrows and, and uh, uh, you know, savannah sparrows and dick thistles uh, right next to cattle that were grazing on, on healthy lands. And so the bird data are used with land cover data to create something called the Bird Friendliness Index, which is a, it's kind of a statistical tool. It was developed by the uh, Missouri River Bird Observatory down in Missouri, and then modified and tweaked by the Audubon Society to create kind of a, just a number that you can use to pretty easily compare, like is this land good for birds uh, in comparison to other lands adjacent that are either, you know, just managed in, in, a, in a different way. Uh, and so this bird friendliness index, and I won't belabor the statistical um, uh, uh, process, but it's basically counting abundance, and how many birds are there, and um, diversity, right? How many kinds of birds are there? And then some measure of resilience. So are, those, are all those birds, uh, you know, the kind of birds that like the same habitat? Or do, do they have different preferences? And that tells us, in the same way that plants do, when you have a diversity of plants, then you've got a resilient environment that can tolerate uh, change. And when you've got a diversity of birds, you've got a more resilient bird community that can adapt to, to change, okay? So we, uh, we, we push out a number, a bird friendliness index number, and ultimately um, it just it varies from zero to one. And uh, a, a BFI, a bird friendliness index of 0.5 or lower, tells you that that uh, surveyed area has a lower bird friendliness score than does the surrounding environment. And a BFI of 0.5 or higher tells you that that is, uh, has a, a more resilient, more diverse, more abundant bird community than the surrounding environment. Because it's new to Minnesota, I don't have much data to share with you yet, but I can share with you from uh, certified ranches uh, to our, our south and, uh, and east. And we find that, again, it's not uniform. There are some circum a few of these ranches where, where you know, the bird community uh, has not responded well yet. We believe that with continued management, we can improve those. But the majority of these certified ranches had a healthier uh, bird community, more abundant, more diverse, more resilient than the surrounding environment. And so we believe that this is, there is some teeth to this, that this is genuinely bird-friendly land management. Uh, in Minnesota, our, uh, this is our list of focal species. And what focal species means is that these are the species that our grassland ecologist will try and manage for, right? So if you take a, a, a ranch in, up in the northwest in Monoman County, we can say, all right, which of these species is likely to be in that environment? Take a walk through the pasture and look at the, you know, the complex of wetlands and, and woods and whatever might be and say, we think that we can make a few tweaks here and improve the, the conditions for upland sandpiper and we can modify a few things over there and bar marbled godwits might like that. And, um, and we even threw in red-headed woodpecker. Woohoo! right, there's our cavity nester. Because we know that red-headed woodpeckers, of course, are a species of conservation need in the region and they benefit from healthy oak savannas and that in Minnesota, a lot of our grazing lands are in that prairie forest transition. Very few of our, of our ranches are going to be pure prairies with no trees nearby. Many of them are in sort of savanna ecosystems, and Greg's going to define savanna for us when I'm done here, right? Um, 
And so, again, most of these are grassland species, but, uh, but there are a few of them that benefit from, from sort of that uh, savanna type uh, environment. So, we are a bird conservation organization, and we are uh, uh, first wanting to make sure that birds are benefiting from this program, but we are not surprised and delighted to share that there's, there are many benefits beside bird conservation, right? That their carbon can be sequestered in healthy prairie ecosystems through that uh, expansive network of, of roots and healthy native grasslands, that we create resilience when we have healthy soils and a more diverse uh, community of plants. And so there are, uh, you know, uh, insects and small mammals and, and other things that will benefit in addition to our suite of grassland birds. And so, again, as I started, this program is, um, is active in the western United States. Uh, we have over just barely over 100 ranches certified, uh, a little uh, over 3 million acres of, of private lands that are creating good habitat for birds. Right? And if that doesn't stand out to you, think about how much of our conservation planning is around protecting lands from humans. Right? The opportunity to create conservation value on private lands is a, it's not a, it's not a new approach, we're not the first people to have tried this, but it's a critical component of biodiversity conservation in North America. If we only have healthy habitat on protected lands, I, I believe we will not achieve our goal of retaining our, our bird communities. Um, so this is the, the existing um, uh, map of, of ranches, and this is the, the expansion map. Thanks to funding from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, which has been very good to this program and has supported uh, our, our staffing needs across the United States, we are certifying ranches in Minnesota. Um, I already told you that you won't find our seal on grocery stores in Minnesota, but what you will find in Minnesota are, are the, the beef that comes from Thousand Hills Corporation. Some of you may have heard of them. Thousand Hills Lifetime Grazed is based in Minnesota, but they have ranches all over. They're sort of a co-op model. Uh, they're based in Clearwater, which is just outside of St. Cloud. And we are, uh, through our partnership with them, we are certifying every single one of their ranches across the country because they want to be part of this program. And they're already doing a pretty good job of managing their lands and creating healthy soils and plant communities. And we'll, we're helping them improve those to make sure they're also ha healthy habitats for birds. Um, and so we've got new grassland ecologists hired in Minnesota and Wisconsin and a future plan to expand further into Iowa and enhance what we're doing in Missouri, which is the region where I manage, Minnesota, Iowa, and Missouri for the Upper Mississippi River office. So again, I'm very excited about this and telling you about it because the, the success of this program is dependent on you, really, making a concerted effort to be intentional about, about whose beef you, you buy and, and eat. Right? So this is, a, this is really a, 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 um, a bird conservation program masked by a, a marketing effort. Right? It is dependent on, on your willingness to, to change your consumer behavior. Um, so we have a number of staff in the, in the state that are involved in this project. Uh, I am the, the director of conservation, but uh, Sarah Hewitt and Kristen Zumo and, and Alex Ward were all involved in certifying ranches and building partnerships. Uh, you're welcome to contact any of us. I know there's at, le at least a couple people in this room that do graze cattle and are like, this is interesting. I'd love to talk to you more about that. And so we're hoping to meet with you and, and, uh, and, and think about certification. Um, but I hope that I'll also, there's, those of you that don't have cattle in your backyard would also think about, uh, about your, your shopping habits. So I think we have a little time left for questions. What's the um, cost to implement rotational grazing, or is there one in terms of daily gain or headcount you can support or labor to implement it? Is it a to the rancher? Yeah. I mean, so there's no cost to getting certified by Audubon. We don't charge them anything. We have grants to support uh, our staff that are out writing habitat management plans and whatnot. 
to the rancher, you know, it's, it's a, a, a sort of complex because if you are going to raise cattle and feed them without pasture, then you're buying food. Uh, or if you are raising cattle on pasture, then the food comes free. And so, you know, ranching economics is not my field, and it's a very complex one, but uh, it can be done pretty sustainably, right? It's like you can raise more cattle by buying food, but you're paying for the food, and so the economic outcomes are complex. So. I'm, I'm dancing around the fact that I don't really have a good, clear answer for you, um, but at least the cost of certification is nothing except for the time uh, that's required um, to, to, to meet with us and talk about how they manage their land and, and consider uh, options to modify that to benefit birds. Oh, sure. I, I'll let somebody else decide who's asking questions. So. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess it's a follow-up yeah. question, which is what's the appetite, especially from large ranches which do a lot of damage and are not incentivized to this program? Um, it's a great question. Uh, so the question, if everyone heard it, what about large ranches? So um, also complex. In, in Minnesota, there really are no large ranches. Um, uh, most of our cattle ranches are on a couple hundred acres or sometimes 40 or 50 acres. Uh, when you get out west, it's much more common to see hundreds or thousands or even millions of acres. We have a, a, a ranch that's being certified that's 400,000 acres. Uh, so it's compatible with large ranches in the west, even if we don't have any of those here. And um, I think some of that is, is market driven, right? If there's a market for it, then maybe they're open to, to doing that. And I, I can't give you names, but what we've had names that you would all would recognize approach us and say, hey, what would it take to get Audubon certified beef in our restaurant? And, and we say, oh my goodness, we can't produce that much beef, but let's, let, let us figure out how to try and get there, right? So we're, we're, we're trying to solve those challenges right now. Yep. I, I have a question kind of along the same line, um, kind of a supply chain question. I mean, yeah. mostly your presentation, your program deals with the producer. Um, and I'm wondering, looking at the supply chain and how you come into Minnesota, um, what um, uh, you will be doing to look at con retail consumer outlets and also even, you know, slaughtering of, of animals. Um, I know in the last question had to do with the scale of the ranches. Uh, Land Stewardship Project works with cattle farmers in mm -hmm. western Minnesota. Uh, you know, are, are they possibly participants in the program. So what's the, what's, what's the supply chain here? Yes, that's a, that's a fantastic question. And arguably, that's, that's the biggest challenge of getting this done. Lots of, um, for those of you that aren't fully versed in, in, in ranching, uh, a lot of what we call cow-calf operations are excited about this because, because ca cattle are often, young cattle are often raised on pasture. But then they are sold to finishers, which put them into feedlots, and our program does not allow cattle to be finished on, on feedlots. So the supply chain issue is substantial, um, and we are, we are partnering with Land Stewardship Project, Sustainable Farming Association, NRCS, all of the big ag groups. We talk with them and, and, and figuring out how to coordinate these things. And I think, um, notably, if I can say something positive about the state of Wisconsin. Am I allowed to do that? Uh, uh, the University of Wisconsin has a, um, a, a program called Grasslands 2.0, uh, based out of the University of Wisconsin. And there, they have not just ecologists, but, uh, but agricultural economists who are dealing with grass-fed beef. Because when you go to the grocery store, you go to Thousand Hills, it's going to be more expensive than what you pay for at Costco or, or Aldi or whatever, right? And people sometimes assume it's just, you know, you're raising cattle in a not very effective, efficient way. And I don't think that's necessarily the truth. A lot of the cost is actually tied to, to slaughter practices, right? And so all of our cattle have to be slaughtered in USDA-approved facilities or state-approved facilities. And that process, um, or that, that supply chain issue is extraordinarily complex. Audubon is a bird conservation organization, so we don't pretend to think we can solve that problem. But we are delighted to partner with Grasslands 2.0 and lots of other smart agricultural economists and supply chain experts across the country that are, we are actively having those conversations about how to, 
deal with that because we don't want those challenges to stand in the way of what otherwise could be a really, I think, effective program for conservation. Th so thanks, that's a tough one. I, uh, I'm dancing around the fact that I don't know the answer to that one either, right? Yeah, and I j thank you for pointing out Thousand Hills. For anyone in the Twin Cities, a lot of the co-ops carry their products. Yes, yes they do. I have a quick question, hopefully. Sure. Thank you so much. I'm glad to see that this is getting traction in the Midwest. It's mm -hmm. a great opportunity to work with private landowners and wondering how dairy will soon fit into this process. Because in Wisconsin and, and Minnesota, that is where the operations are um, larger. Yes, that's a great question. Um, and one that we are thinking about, and one that we get questions about, because Minnesota and Wisconsin, right, it, probably have more cattle for dairy than we do for, for beef. Uh, and so because of that, we are actively pursuing that and um, trying to think about whether I'm allowed to say the name of the, some of the people we're, we're talking with. But there's a, we'll just say for now, there's a, a large uh, producer of grass-fed dairy products that most of you are probably familiar with that we um, have recently submitted a, a grant in partnership with so that we can go out and do bird surveys on their land and see if their practices are as bird friendly as the beef practices are. Again, if you know much about dairy and beef, those grazing practices are very different. You can just have beef sort of rotating through as long as you've got water and fence, they're great. Of course, dairy cattle have to be milked a couple times a day. Uh, and so you can't just sort of send them out and then rotate them around. You have to have them in a central area. But, but there are some really great grass-fed dairy programs that are doing amazing work and they're interested in how can we make sure that our practices are benefiting not only water and soil and the environment, but also birds. So yes, we're working on it. It's, we don't yet have a grazed on bird friendly dairy uh, product stamp yet. <laughs> I'm hopeful that, w that that's on the way, but no guarantees. Yeah, um, I have a question <clears throat> about another grazer, um, horses. We have a lot of um, horse land around here in Minnesota. Do you have any programs that for bird friendly uh, ranches, uh, horse ranches or farms um, for somebody who wants to you know, either put in native grasses for their horses to feed on or, you know, a good program um, for rotating them? Yes, that's it. Um, I appreciate that question because people have often, well, what about sheep, right? Or, or what, about, uh, what about the chickens that are brought around to, to on the pastures after the cattle go through? You know, can we have bird-friendly chickens? That almost seems a little ironic, right? But um, <laughs> uh, so, 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 the short answer is no, we don't have a program for, for you know, bird-friendly horse pastures or, or sheep uh, grazing. Um, at this point, I think that, uh, that beef is the biggest need and, and the biggest opportunity as far as how much beef is consumed in the United States and the opportunity to make an impact on birds. Horse pastures would be a much smaller footprint. But with that said, uh, we have, we're wanting to help those people that are like, hey, I'm a, I'm a sheep farmer and I want it to be bird friendly as well. So we recently applied for some funding that would give us a little bit more latitude, right? Because right now, we, the funding we have is to certify um, bison and cattle ranches, but we soon will have a little bit more flexibility to work with people that are, um, that are grazing a, a greater diversity of, of livestock. Um, I have been so long sitting here, uh, sorry. Uh, uh, how do you reconcile, given that uh, the carbon, carbon problem, one third of it is related to agriculture. Yep. So how do you reconcile uh, that and cattle? Yep. Um, do you have uh, uh, measures for which you determine whether or not it's a carbon negative or a car carbon positive yeah. situation? Yeah. Super great question, yeah, because this is, I, mean, I think, probably the, my first reaction to the thought of bird, you know, environmentally friendly cattle, that's, that seems um, challenging in the context of, of carbon. So it's important to note that, that a lot of the challenges around, around cattle and carbon is not just methane and their belching, but also the fact that most cattle are fed corn and soybeans, and, and it's the, the supply chain. So when you feed cattle off of pasture, um, 
the carbon challenge is is much reduced, right? And then I, I guess it, if it's so, and we know that that carbon uh, is sequestered in healthy prairie soils. So we're in the process, actually, of, of doing very intensive, like the Cadillac level of soil surveys on 100 of our ranches across the Western United States to answer that question with great precision. It's in process, so we don't have it yet. But ultimately, I guess when it comes to just the existence of the cattle and their belching and their methane that comes from that and our climate concerns associated with that, I, I, I just remind myself that, that bison do the same thing, right? And that there were once millions and millions of bison, and so we don't want to say that we can't have ungulates. We just want them to be raised in a way that's as carbon and environmentally conscious way as possible. And I think that this process is as, about as good as it's going to get as far as um, you're going to sequester carbon in the soil, you're going to prevent the release of carbon from corn and soybean production, and all that's left is their methane production, which is, is not nothing, but it's compared to what's associated with cattle raised in feedlots is huge difference. Thanks for that question. And th sure.